Hi everybody, today we're going to try to do a lab actually, which is really impossible um, the way that we would do it in class, but we're gonna do our best. And um, you may wonder, why don't we just wait until everyone's back from COVID to do this lab? And that's because um, we have a lot more to cover this year. I know a lot of you are anxious to start the dissections and we can't dissect an animal till we learn about it and we still have to learn about plants. So I'm pushing this along um, just because like I tend to geek out about microbiology and stuff under the microscope, but most of my students are not as excited as me about it and would um, appreciate the fact that we might keep going and, you know, arrive at our um, study of animals a little faster with enough time to actually really um, enjoy. I enjoy dissections, but enjoy the dissections. Um, so I brought um, one of the microscopes home from school when I left on Monday. So here's, you know, you're familiar with our little microscope. And I brought a whole box of prepared slides that have samples of um, fungi and different types of protist on them. And I looked at each one of these under the microscope and I took pictures using, you know, that little tablet that we have that can serve as a, um, there's a camera on top of the microscope and the tablet can capture the images. So I took pictures of them and I made a slideshow and I'm gonna run through that slideshow for you. Um, and at different times along the way, I'm going to like have you pause the video and draw um, what you see um, up on the screen. And that's just how we're gonna do it. At least one portion, the first portion of this lab. So you're going to need that sheet that looks like this, um, that is on Canvas for today. Just print that out. It has spaces where you can draw what you see and spaces to put the name and the magnification of the organism you're looking at and also enough room on the sides for you to be able to label properly. So you are going to need that. Um, and then the other thing I want you to do is just run through the PowerPoint with you, like I said, as you're drawing. So I have to stop here for a minute because last time I tried to do this, it, um, it, I, I didn't do it right. So let me pause this recording and then I'll be right back with you. Okay. So here we are, and I will also put this PowerPoint um, just by itself up on Canvas in case you want to go through it in your own time, um, like without having to pause the video where you can um, just draw what you see. So it'll be there too. Um, but yeah, so we're looking at protist and fungi under the microscope. And first, we're going to look at the kingdom fungi. Now, the kingdom fungi, um, remember that members of that kingdom can't photosynthesize. Um, they can't, um, they do have cell walls, but not the same kind of cell walls as plants have. And they need to um, eat other things because they can't photosynthesize. There's different types of fungi. One of them is a cup fungus. And there's a picture of a cup fungus shown here. And a cup fungus is sort of like if you, it's, it's sort of like if you took a mushroom, <laughs> like the way a mushroom normally is, and you ripped off the cap and you flipped the cap upside down and then stuck it on the stalk, that's sort of what a cup fungus is. On a mushroom, the underside of the cap is the place where all of the spores that are used for reproduction are made. Spores are sort of like the seeds of a fungus. But with a cup fungus, it's just the opposite. The spores are all made down inside the cup. So this is showing you like a diagram of the cup part of the fungus and these little um, structures called ASCII. And the ASCII um, create these spores in them. And then the spores are released in the environment. And when they land in a spot that is good for a fungus to grow, then they will start growing. And it's really super hard to control fungal growth, um, especially outside because fungal spores are just everywhere. They're microscopic and they just 
they blow around from all the different fungi all the time. So um, you're gonna be looking at a slide that's taken from basically like this area right here. So like that, kind of right that area right there. And you're gonna see the parts that are inside the cup that make the spores. And then you're gonna see the other part of the body of the cup fungus, which is basically just bunches of stringy cells all clumped together. Um, and those cells are called hyphae. So here um, is that what I told you about. You notice there's nothing that you have to draw yet. If you have to draw something, then I will put a message on the slide that says, you know, like draw me or whatever. Um, but here's what I was telling you about. Here's those little um, ASCII cells that have the spores stacked up inside of them, ready to be released into, you know, the body of the cup. And then down here, you have all kinds of little stringy cells that are just kind of globbed together um, to make the rest of the structure of the cup fungus. So this is at 40 times. This is lowest magnification on our microscope. When we go up to 100 times, we can see those spore producing structures super up close, and we can see a little bit more um, the hyphae down here that are strung out. So what I would have you do, whether you're in class or at home, is pause the video right here um, and then take a few minutes to draw what you see in the box, label the ASCII, um, the hyphae, and the spores, label just what I have labeled there, but you're only drawing this part right here. And then of course, make sure you put the name of what you're looking at and the magnification on the line above the drawing. Okay, the next fungus that we're going to look at is um, an actual mushroom. And so, like I said, it's sort of like a cup fungus turned upside down. In a mushroom, the spores are produced under the cap and um, they're released down from the cap and um, get, you know, just land directly on the soil or get carried on animal fur or um, in the wind or whatever. Um, and you can see from this diagram how there's these stringy cells called the hyphae that make up the big bulk of the body of the mushroom. And then there's underneath there, there are those little spore producing cells. And the spore producing cells in a mushroom look a little different than they do in a cup fungus. So this is showing you a longitudinal section of the mushroom. And so what that means is you took this mushroom right here and um, you cut it like this way not across like this, but up and down like that. And now you're looking at just a portion of it. That's what longitudinal section means, LS. And you see that like here, you can tell the cells are long and um, not organized into particular tissues. They're just kind of clumped together. Those are the hyphae all up in here. And then on the underside of the cap, you see these, um, spore producing cells and um, they're these little long skinny regions and you see some of the spores being um, released or having been released. So you can pause here for a few minutes and draw um, what you see and label as you see it here. Now we're gonna look at that same type of mushroom, but we're gonna look at what you see here, which is a cross section. And this is still the lowest magnification. So basically we took the cap and we sliced it this way, and then we put a slice of it on the microscope. And so we can see what are called the gills of the mushroom, which is where up underneath the cap, you see these like, extensions that radiate out and lining the gills all along the way are those cells that are going to continue to produce spores. 
And then on the inside of the gills, there's just more of those hyphae cells, just all kind of, again, just kind of clumped together to make up the body. So you're gonna draw and label what you see in the box, the gills and the spore producing cells. The next thing you're gonna draw is a really up close view of one of the gills. So this whole thing is the, it's the coprinus mushroom gill, it's this, it's what you just saw right here, but you're literally looking at just like this portion of it on the next slide. And it's just gonna show you really up close the difference between those stringy, long cells that make up the hyphae and the little columnar cells that are all about producing the spores. And here's like one of the spores about to um, be released from this spore producing cell. And in each type of fungus, the type, the name of the cells that produce the spores differs. Um, and, you know, so there's like basidiophores and candidophores and stuff like that. But I think it's just, you know, it's good enough for you to know, to, to kind of understand like where the spores are being produced. So pause here, draw what you see. Okay, the next type of fungus we're gonna look at is called a lichen. And you may remember from seventh grade that a lichen, so here's pictures of lichens that are growing on old sticks here. And believe it or not, this came from like an ad from Etsy or something. So apparently there are people who will buy sticks with lichen on them, which are found so abundantly here in our deciduous forest, <laughs> but whatever. Um, so if you took this lichen and you um, put it under the microscope, then what you would see is something like this, where you see everything that's kind of white and gray is from the fungus. Um, so those are the hyphae, the stringy cells of the fungus, but then there'll be these tiny little cells all nestled in between the hyphae that are actually not fungal cells. They are protists, they're algae. And this is a symbiotic relationship where both benefit. The algae provide um, a source of food for the fungus and because they can tend to live like even on rocks and things like that where they wouldn't normally be able to get any food from the rock. Um, and then the algae, um, what they get from the fungus is they get protection and they get moisture. Um, and so they both benefit from this symbiotic relationship. And the thallus is just the part that has nothing to do with reproduction. So while the other parts I've shown you, the parts of the fungus that have to do with spore production, this part of the lichen has nothing to do with production of spores. So here's a portion of the thallus. You see what you're supposed to label. The dark little circles, which would look green, like, or red or something like, cause there's different types, there's gold algae, um, but they've just stained it so that you can see it. So those little dots are the algae, the stringy cells that are making up the fungus are the hyphae. And you can see how near the surface where the sun would be coming, um, the algae are all nestled up in the hyphae. Okay, the next type of fungus you're going to draw is called aspergillus. This is a mold, and this mold actually can cause trouble in lots of different ways. It's a pathogen, and um, it's like parasitic, so it likes to live off of things that are still alive. It can get in our lungs um, if we've had some sort of a scar, um, or abscess in our lung that's created a little pocket, and then we breathe in the fungal spores from aspergillus, then those fungi can start multiplying in our lungs and make these little, um, well, you see, they're called um, fungal balls <laughs> um, inside our lungs, which obviously is a disease state for us. Here's what it looks like growing on a petri dish. Here's what it looks like on corn. And here's what it, the, reproductive structures look like under the microscope. And of course, it's these spores that are so um, harmful because they're just in the air all the time. And um, they can just be breathed in when you don't even realize it. And then you can have, you know, troubles with infections in your lungs with that happening. 
So this is like a little, it looks like Horton, here's a who almost, this little stop and this structure on the end. This is where the spores are produced and the spores are those little black things. And then you see all these hyphae, these stringy cells that, um, that make up the bulk of the mold, but when it's time for the mold to reproduce, it'll make these spore producing structures. Okay, um, another type of fungus is another type of mold, which makes similar spore producing structures. This is one that we probably are all familiar with and that's black bread mold. Um, when you open up that package and you see the black hairy stuff on your bread, uh, it looks hairy because of those hyphae, those fungal fibers, and then um, it can feel look powdery because of the spores that are produced um, on the stalks that extend from the hyphae. So this is black bread mold under the microscope and um, looks similar somewhat to the aspergillus mold, but um, Here's the spore producing structure. Here we don't see any mature spores that have yet been released, but we do see those classic stringy fungal cells that make up the body of the mold. Okay, now we're ready to move on to the kingdom protista, a whole different kingdom. And within the kingdom protista, there are fungi like protists animal-like protists and algae-like protists, um, plant-like protists, which are the algae. So we're gonna look at the animal-like protists first, which are the protozoa. Um, this is a paramecium. It's a ciliate protozoan. And here it is multiplied a um, hundred times and here it is multiplied 400 times. So I would actually like you to label the drawing that, um, to draw and label the one magnified 400 times. Uh, protos these protozoa are found largely, um, widely and naturally in freshwater environments. You're going to be able to look at some of those um, live um, in the next part of this lab. This is another ciliate protozoan. This is a stentor. And stentors actually come in lots of different shapes, but um, one thing they have in common is that they have this ring of cilia around their mouth to draw the food in. This is just one single cell big. Um, these are unicellular organisms, as are the paramecia. Again, really common in fresh water. Okay, this is another protozoan that has cilia, excuse me. This is Bordicella, and they're the cutest little things, I think. They look like a little cup that's on this springy stalk, and um, each one of them attaches on its own to usually like a surface, like a rock or a stick or something like that. And then they have this cilia, like the stentor, they have this, this ring of cilia that, that lines their cup and draws food down into um, the cup where they can grab it. So um, these are common in both fresh and salt water. And um, I think there's one of them in the algae sample that I showed you. Okay, these are radiolaria and these are protozoa, but what you're seeing here is actually just their skeletons. Most radiolaria make skeletons that are made out of silica, which literally is glass. And there's these just, they come in just this huge variety of shapes. And um, I love looking at anything under the microscope, but I, um, I just especially love these because they're so diverse and yet you just need to draw one of those. Um, they live in the marine environments. They are big, part of plankton, they're free floating. Um, the cool thing about them is I just think about like for years and years and like thousands and thousands of years, these things probably were in existence, right? But like nobody knew about it because we didn't have any microscopes. And I just, 
always when I see these, I think about the day that the first person must have seen these under the microscope and how exciting it must have been for God to, to know that like this part of his creation was going to be revealed to the eyes of men, you know, for the first time. Um, he, he made them so pretty and so delicate and he didn't have to make them like that at all. He could have just made them really plain, but he chose to make them just so beautiful and what a joy that must have been to see them for the first time. Okay, now this is the big event that you guys have probably been waiting for all your lives, even if you didn't realize it. I'm pretty sure like every other event in your life at this point is going to be like a letdown after this one, but you are getting ready to meet the Amoeba sisters. Yes. Pinky and Petunia. This is what they really look like under the microscope with their little pseudopodia extended. And so you can understand why um, it's common when these guys are stained in the lab. I don't know why, but sometimes they stain pink and sometimes they stain purple, even on the same slide. I do not know why, but you can understand why then that the Amoeba sisters draw themselves pink and purple. I want you to draw and label both of them. You can see their big fat nucleus and you can see that their shapes are very amorphous. They can, I'm gonna show you a live amoeba on the, um, when we get to that part of this lab and you'll see like how that happens. Here, by the way, are the actual amoeba sisters, in case you ever wondered what they really look like. I don't know which one's which in this drawing. I know one of them is actually a biology teacher and one of them is like a self-taught cartoonist. Um, I don't know if this is Petunia and she's wearing a purple shirt or what, but that's them. You don't have to draw them. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the kingdom protista, which are the algae or the plant. Um, we're still in the kingdom protista. We've been talking about the kingdom protista. Sorry, we just were talking about the animal-like protists. Now we're to the plant-like protists. And um, here you have um, um, an algae that it makes up part of the phytoplankton in the ocean. So lots of this in marine waters, they can, um, certain types of dinoflagellates also occur in fresh water and they can even like grow in ice and stuff like that. So if you've ever been out West and you've seen the ice, um, like up on top of the mountains where it seems to like never melt. I guess that's called permafrost. Sometimes it'll be like a reddish color or something like that. Um, that's because these algae can grow like even in the ice. Um, excuse me. And um, this particular, um, one of the species of dinoflagellates is responsible for red tides. So red tide is not just like Alabama. Um, but um, <laughs> it's like, it's when you get an overgrowth of this particular type of algae in that part of the ocean. And it's actually really damaging for the fishing industry because um, if the fish eat too much of this plankton or if the things that the fish eat, eat too much of the plankton, it can build up in their bodies and it can be like um, poisonous to the fish. Okay, this type of algae is called spirogyra, and I just love it so much that I'm having you draw both of these pictures. <laughs> this shows, um, it's a colonial filamentous algae, and its cytoplasm just takes this really cool shape inside of its um, cell wall. Um, this is a colony, so you see that like there's one cell attached to another, attached to another, attached to another. They can live in this form and do, but they also could live on their own if the cells were separated from one another. So this is um, a view at 100 times, and this is a view at 400 times. This is Eulothrix, and this might look familiar to you because there's a lot of this algae around where we live. It makes rocks really almost kind of hairy looking, and when you step on them, they're real slippery and slimy because they make a capsule. Um, one cell of the Eulothrix 
um, looks sort of like that, but they love to form these really long filaments as part of a colony. They're not blue, they're green. In fact, there's going to be some in the um, in the live seed that I show you, um, but this is just the particular name that this one has. Okay, and finally, I think this is the last one. Yes, um, we're, I'm gonna have you draw a bull box. You're also gonna see a living bull box in, um, under the microscope um, when we get to that part. Um, bull box are actually um, huge colonies of individual cells. Every little like tiny polka dot type thing is an individual cell that has flagella on it. And they make this hollow sphere out of their um, out of those cells, and then down inside the sphere, there can be these like clusters of cells where they're like starting to form a new colony, and eventually they'll like burst out of the like original colony. So these can be really really huge or smaller depending on like how kind of old the colony is, and they live in a variety of them. Um, freshwater environments. Okay, so once you've made all of those drawings and labeled them and um, make sure that you have the magnification and the organism name above each drawing, then that part of the lab is done. For the second part of the lab, um, I'm just going to have you watch a playlist of videos that I made here at home at my desk um, looking at the live um, cultures that were sent to me by Carolina um, because I'm afraid they probably won't still be alive when I get to see you again. So let me stop here in the recording and I'll be right back to show you what those live cultures um, look like when they came in. Okay, so um, Carolina sends the cultures to teachers in little containers like this. And um, when you get them, of course, they're all sealed up and you have, you know, you have to like, it probably, I don't know if you can see this, but it says like loosen the cap, mm, somewhere in there, whatever. It just says loosen the caps on cultural jars immediately, you know, so like we can give them some air. And so, that's what I did. And you get these little pipettes that come with them. And then when you want to look at them under the microscope, you use something called a concavity slide. And it's a slide that has a little, I'm trying to see, it's where you can, you can kind of, it's kind of ground out in the middle and make sort of like a little well in the slide. And then you can put a drop of the culture that you want to look at um, down into that well and then um, put it under the microscope. The cool thing is um, they have a lot of room, the, the organisms have room to kind of swim around and um, they're not squished down. So it's kind of cool to see them moving. And that's also the uncool thing because <laughs> they're able to move so much that like it, you wouldn't think it, but that little tiny, amount of space for them to move around gives them room to go up down twirl all around and like if you try to keep it in constant focus then it might be up here and it's in focus but now it goes down to the bottom and it's not as in focus anymore and it's spinning and swims away from you and so it's a real challenge to um film things under those conditions um there's a couple tricks you can use one is a little bottle of stuff called proto slow that you can put in to slow the organisms down. Another thing um, you can do is take a cotton ball and just pick off a few of the fibers of the cotton ball and stick those fibers down in the well along with your organisms. And um, so then the organisms like they don't die, but they get kind of trapped in the fibers and have to move more slowly. So I tried both of those things when I made um, the slides. And so you'll see that, um, you'll see those stringy things sometimes on the, on the video. The other thing is I made these beautiful videos <laughs> using the camera that, and the tablet that came with the, um, 
microscope. And then I transferred those videos to my um, laptop so that I could, you know, um, like edit them and put them all together. But my laptop wouldn't open any of those videos. <laughs> So I made all these videos that could not be opened. I know you guys can relate to that from your microscope project, some of you. But so what I ended up having to do was like play the videos on the tablet while I recorded them with my iPad. <laughs> and then um, I uploaded those recordings to YouTube and made a playlist. So it's a little bit um, wonky, but that's just because I'm my equipment is limited, my time is limited, and my skills are definitely limited. So I'm not like ashamed of it. I think it's good for the equipment that I had and the time that I have, but I understand that it's far from professional. So um, I hope that you'll be able to learn from them and enjoy them. And if by time I get back with you again, um, they're still alive and you have time and you want to stop by, you're very welcome to look at them for yourself. Um, so this portion of the lab is over. You can take pictures of your um, drawings and upload them. And then um, now I just need you to watch those videos on the playlist. Um, and for each video, I just want you to write down um, five things that you learned about the organism being that you're viewing from that video. And that'll be it. All right. I look forward to being with y'all again. I hope you're doing well and I will talk to you later.